Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Well, I'm absolutely pumped. It's been a huge week. I spent it at EdCon. I got to meet Vitalik. There's been so much crypto news, so much happening in the macro world. I've got my Wabi hoodie on. That project exploded higher after some Binance news, and we got our premium members into that trade early again. I'm going to talk about all that and more, so let's get into it. Plenty going on at EdCon this week, and the opening ceremony certainly reminded me um, that we're all a little bit weird. We're early adopters. We know this space is you know, breaking new ground, but this was particularly weird. I encourage you to check out this uh, opening ceremony wrap from the guys at EdCon. Uh, I let my members know what I believe are the best two projects to come out of EdCon and another trade idea. So guys, if you do want to join us, head over to nuggetsnews.com.au. But there was so much happening at EdCon, hundreds of talks. Um, I absolutely learned so much and I'll continue to um, share and drip feed that information with you guys. Finally, just a bit of housekeeping. We've got $20,000 worth of prizes to give away, some very generous sponsors, friends of the channel. This is free to enter, guys. Head to nuggetsnews.com.au forward slash giveaway if you want to enter. Um, so much to win as we head into Easter. So on this day in crypto history, well, it's been a year since Bitcoin also jumped $1,000 in just 30 minutes, and we know that that wasn't the end of the bear market. So I'm going to talk about that. Two years since uh, Russia wanted to legally recognize Bitcoin, three years since Ethereum was first used to sell and trade energy in Brooklyn, and that wasn't Powerledge. That was another little project. In 2015, Jed McCaleb of Stellar discussed his new protocol. In 2014, Charlie Schramm was indicted. We're going to talk about Julian Assange this week as well. And in 2013, the Winklevoss twins claimed that they owned 1% of all Bitcoins. And you know, you guys know I'm not a fan of uh, talking about how much crypto you have online. It can be very dangerous. Into the macro news, and as always, we'll start in Australia, in our own backyard, where we've seen the share of demand for new property of foreign buyers drop from over 30% back in 2014 down to less than 10%. So huge drops. We know there was lots of Chinese money. I spoke about this at length in our documentary. Check that out if you haven't already. But the metrics are still pretty grim, and I believe house prices are going to continue to trend lower or sideways at best. Um, in Sydney or Melbourne. And this has led to concerns from some rating agencies saying that Australia may lose their AAA rating in future and that banks might not get a lot of support in a crisis. And this is the bail-in scenario that we need to continue to talk about where your deposits will be used to save the banks if they have a liquidity crisis. I'll do videos on this. We'll continue to talk about it with Martin North, but something that I know a lot of you guys are pretty aware of. Now, the confidence in higher education is plummeting. And I think if you're a, a subscriber to this channel, you're pretty aware that you don't have to go to uni. There are so many good startup businesses that have come out of you know, high school dropouts or just hardworking individuals. Now, in that same vein of thought, we've seen some pretty high valuations recently. And I tweeted about this. You know, Uber's got a $100 million valuation. Yes, they've never turned a profit yet, but you know, we Companies try to price in how big growth may be in future, but this is a highly competitive space. A number of other apps other than these two, that tends to compress margins. And I, I've heard a stat recently that there's record amounts of money chasing IPOs. So yes, we know the ICO and the IEO environment tends to get hot, but there's never been more wealth out there with markets near record highs chasing these IPOs. And that stat I read was um, blank check companies where investors write a blank check and just basically say, I've got too much money. I want to invest in something. The number of those is it has just broken to record levels, and that shows you how much uh, money the, the wealthy have accumulated. Now, speaking of wealthy, Facebook have got billions of dollars sitting in the bank, and yet they're seeking to raise a billion dollars. Um, I'm not sure if this is the biggest boon for crypto ever. I imagine this is going to be a stable coin to pay each other, um, start to create a marketplace on Facebook, probably be used on WhatsApp. But let me know what you guys think. This is a very, very centralized payment system. This is not a true cryptocurrency in any sense of the word. Now, one thing I've been talking about is Apple losing their, their shine, their place at the top. And we saw App Store downloads drop for the first time in years. So that theme of people moving to Android phones and a number of other brands, uh, particularly in those developing countries, is something that I think we're going to see continue to play out. Now, I've spoken about demographics a number of times on the channel, and 
It's probably one of the things that people are looking to to save us in Australia. But we turn to Japan, whose economy has been really going sideways for decades now since they went through this whole system of printing money decades before everyone else in their tech bubble. And I recommend you watch uh, Princes of the Yen, that documentary that I spoke about last week as well. But even with record immigration, the pace of Japan's population is still declining. Um, the, the, sorry, the pace of Japan's population decline is accelerating. So one of the things you need to grow your economy, um, a lot of people you know, believe is to grow that population, particularly of working age people. And this is a huge headwind facing a lot of mature economies, aging populations and um, you know, declining populations. So over to the big news this week, and this was Julian Assange. Now, someone sent me this article and we know that the IMF has got close relations to the US. Uh, we, know, we know that money tends to run the world. And um, let me know if you guys think this is um, truth or tin foil. as I say. The IMF deal for Ecuador. So they recently received a bailout of $10 billion from the INF. IMF, and then just a few days later, Julian Assange is arrested, and you know they bow the knee to the U.S. So, do you guys think this is connected? I think this just shows us. Look at the the amount of downvotes to upvotes here. Hillary Clinton reacting to the Julian Assange arrest, and this just shows you that people are angry against world leaders. You know the system, and all this stuff is turning people to that more transparent. We know blockchain brings trust, accountability, transparency. So this is all interconnected. This is why I talk about the macro news, but I think the Clintons have got uh, far more to hide than most people on the planet. In terms of not trusting the mainstream, we've seen a lot of these platforms start to censor a number of big celebrities. And the most subscribed YouTuber, PewDiePie, who does a lot of gaming, a lot of streaming, has partnered with a blockchain platform. So I think we're going to see a turn away, and I think it's a matter of time. I've experienced it personally, being censored or demonetized for videos, particularly if you're talking about something that they don't like. I'm looking forward to reading your comments in the channel below, but I think we're going to hit a critical mass in the coming years where people get off these large platforms that have been farming our data. So the euro is uh, ready's list of 12 billion in reta retaliatory tariffs. That's a mouthful um, on the US. So these are some sort of staple household items, but we often think of the euro and US as friends. But when we see a lot of these um, tariffs and Donald Trump looking after his own, you know they're fighting back and. The people, the average citizen is the, the ones that lose out here. It tends to push up the goods of uh, price of everyday goods. Um, to follow on from this, we see you are, um, the euro and China sign a mandate for a trade haven. So although we have all these relationships and I really see them as you know smiling for the camera type relationships, when push comes to shove, if it's going to be cheaper or it's going to be better for the economy, save them more money, you know, the US and China might be butting heads, but as long as it's going to save the EU money, you know they're starting to make these trade deals. And this is the same with sanctions, uh, one by one, starting to build these relationships to do trade with each other, regardless of what the US, the world police think of these other countries. So China's debt bomb is back, and Beijing injects the most ever credit for the month of March. So a couple of months ago, we saw an absolutely huge amount of capital be injected into the system, 2.6 um, trillion yuan. So they don't want the stock market to correct. They don't want the economy to slow down. They want to pump more money into the banks, into the system, and then the belief is that it trickles down to the local economy. So another huge injection into markets. Um, this was one of the reasons we saw that um, the US markets bounce back. We know that they're really fixated on what's going on in China at the moment. Um, but far out, if you had have told me that markets were going to rebound this sharply, I probably wouldn't have believed you. And I did say back in October, and November, that this wasn't the crash and that I was going to be a buyer of stocks. But the fact we've got back to near record highs so quickly, um, it really is crazy to me. And I think the US is still the uh, cleanest dirty shirt in the laundry as a lot of other economies are slowing at a greater pace and the US is still chugging along relatively okay, but that overhanging debt is what's going to be their downfall longer term. 
Now, on that same sort of theme, the banks are posting record profits while most other areas of the economy are slowing down. And do you think the banks are paying back those bailouts from taxpayer dollars that was used to save them when they were going to go under after they speculated with everyone's money? Uh, not at all. So the big banks um, continuing to post record profits. Um, it, it really, really is frustrating, guys. Um, I caution anyone that these sort of articles will give you high blood pressure, but uh, it's important to cover them. Um, I think we see the the butting of heads here between people like the Jamie Diamonds of the world. He's just posted record profits. He's slamming an alternate payment system because of the rent-seeking nature of banks and finance. They've got it so good. They get to basically print money, charge everyone, record profits, and we see the libertarians, you know, Tim Draper, uh, slamming paranoid Jamie Diamond, and this is something we're going to continue to see play out. Those that are for a fairer system for the people versus those that have it good from the system. They're milking the system. They're rent-seeking. They're making profits. They don't want anything to change. Um, and these are the sort of headlines we're going to continue to see play out. And as I mentioned before, not just the US uh, debt that's overhanging, it's the shadow banking. And for those that don't know, shadow banking is the things that happen you know, outside of the banks or that can't be accounted for. Black budgets and you know the conspiracy theories will say this is used for all sorts of um, you know, segments of the government that we don't hear about and, and all these expenses. So again, blockchain and accountability, how can you possibly have $52 trillion, um, that exists outside the financial system as debt? Uh, it really is insane. This is a huge issue for the US and particularly China. Um, and this is going to dominate the headlines going forward. We know that this is why people are going to turn to a hard currency because there is so much debt out there and, and too many people get to print money out of thin air while the average person is struggling to keep up with the cost of living. And tying all this together, you should not be surprised at all when you see a poll like this. The winner, 56% of people think they'll be paying for lunch with cryptocurrency in five years. It's, it's not cash. We know there's a war on cash coming. Uh, mobile payments maybe, but yeah, bank cards are going to be a thing of the past. Um, I think the IMF maybe got a bit of a surprise, and this is a wake-up call for all world leaders that the people, um, cryptocurrency is becoming you know the people's currency. So into the crypto news here, and this was fantastic news from a mese ago, the public alpha announcement. I interviewed uh, Pong at EdCon this week. This is a project that's been one of my favorites. It's fallen behind schedule. It's been pretty disappointing, but they're now out talking about capacity of 2,700 transactions per second on the Amisigo testnet using Plasma, blockchains within blockchains. This is one of those projects that's got me very excited again. In terms of that remittance space, every week we seem to be reading headlines of you know Western Union, who used to be the enemy, partnering with more of these e-wallet services um, for cross-border payments and remittance. It's very, very competitive. Um, whether or not it's going to be a decentralized or, or a centralized one of the banks that are going to adopt that system, I still think peer-to-peer -peer decentralized has the best chance because centralized systems are always going to be charging higher fees to make money for their business. Coinbase released their debit card this week. I think I've got four crypto debit cards in my wallet. So when I hear people say that you can't spend Bitcoin anywhere, it's simply not true, guys. I will make a video about that soon, but there's plenty of options no matter where you are in the world these days. Um, and 10X is probably one of the most widely used. Now, Coinbase has added three more tokens, and these are projects that I own all three of. So I've been saying for a lo the longest time that Augur and Maker are going to be added to Coinbase. You know, I got you guys in on basic attention token, 0x. So we've continued to you know tick off what we believe are the best projects, and Coinbase, I guess, is of the same opinion. So this is absolutely fantastic news. We know that Coinbase is still the leader in the US. Um, you know, they're leading the way in custody. Uh, and all sorts of things here. But Augur have got version 2 coming up, and I think this is going to get the spotlight. So the prediction markets, they're going to let you um, make calls in stable coins rather than all the bets being uh, based in Ethereum. Plenty of other changes. I won't talk about that too much. That's probably a video on its own, but Augur is one of the projects that I believe is one of the best utility tokens. In terms of decentralized finance, the guys over at Dharma opens their public borrowing and lending this week. Uh, I recommend that you head over to loanscan.io to compare 
uh, the borrowing and lending rates for a lot of these different platforms. So loanscan.io if you guys want to check that out for more information. Xerox have updated their roadmap. Um, some good news for, for staking based liquidity incentives and we're always looking for ways to give that ZRX token um, more utility and better economics. So it's it's so pleasing for me that we I do feel like we're in crypto spring where all my favorite projects, projects that I own continue to come out with good news and they're starting to um, you know, trend upwards in price as well. Now, CZ is a controversial character. We know that, but he came out this week and just said, you know, enough of the crap. Um, we're going to delist Bitcoin Satoshi Vision because of Craig's behavior. So I tend to try and avoid all these guys. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Is Craig coming out and suing people that say he isn't Satoshi taking it too far? Or is court going to prove that, as Craig says, he was one of the individuals that worked in Satoshi in the early days? Or has his character pivoted so much that it's not even important whether or not he was involved in the early days? Let me know what you think in the comments below. So crypto hedge fund Polychain Capital, one of the best funds out there. They've been in this game for a couple of years and they had a 40% drop in their assets in Q4. So I know as hodlers, we feel bad when we see our portfolio go down huge percent. It's crypto, guys. This is part of the fun. The best investors in the world are taking huge losses. This is just in one quarter as well. I'm sure their fund's down you know, 80% from the peak like a lot of our altcoins. So hang in there, guys. Um, there's better times coming. And this is evidenced by things like Harvard investing in cryptocurrency. So as this article said, it's a ridiculously big deal. One by one, we see the first you know, the hedge fund, the first schools, universities. So we know that this space is being legitimized every day. And personally, I see huge sums of money coming in compared to the last bull run. Um, that doesn't mean the bottom in, but we'll talk about price later on. So Bitstamp has been granted a bit license. And so for those that don't know, um, the New York bit license was very controversial back in the day, and it actually forced a lot of innovation to move away from New York. And that's why we see so many smart individuals moving to Malta and these other jurisdictions. So look, I think this is a good example of what can go wrong when you over-regulate. And it probably took a few years for this to play out, but they're still playing catch up. They lost so much uh, potential tax revenue and innovation because of the regulations they put in place. And speaking of regulations, um, over to China, uh, where we're reading about banning mining is the headline, guys. But I think you know this has been overstated. It's undesirable to waste power, but if we have all this coming from renewables, um, these changes aren't going to be put in place for months now. So keep an eye on this. But I actually think from talking to people at the conference, there's so much happening in the blockchain space in China. They're still going to sell their miners. It's still going to happen you know, in the fringes in rural areas around the dams. I don't think they're going to ever stamp out Bitcoin mining. So one of the biggest headwinds for Bitcoin and Ethereum, one of the most important videos I've ever done, they tend not to get a lot of views, the most important ones, but privacy is the biggest headwind for Bitcoin and Ethereum. Both of them are talking about implementing privacy and I introduced you guys to this concept um, last year and Andreas has come out himself this week and said that fungibility is one of Bitcoin's biggest um, headwinds. So fungibility in some ways, it means is one Bitcoin equal to another. So we, it is important to um, incorporate privacy there. Ethereum's implementing ZK Snarks. That's going to be great for scaling and privacy. So Bitcoin has Mimble, Wimble, um, Dandelion, all sorts of privacy implementations coming. But the real risk here is um, whether or not we can get these changes into the network. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Lightning Network does bring about more privacy if we have plenty of nodes and we can find a route to another user. So Wallet of Satoshi, this absolutely blew me away at our meetup the other night. It was great to meet you all. Thanks for coming if you are watching this video. But a 61-year-old gentleman um, came up and said, hey, I want to thank you for putting on food and drink. I sent me 200,000 sats, so $14 via Lightning Network. One click of a button and it would happen. And this was just sort of an aha moment for me that this is happening in the real world. And particularly with not, you know, a 20 to 30 year old um, that tends to dominate this space. So well done. Um, congrats if you're out there keeping up with the technology. This is a great graphic about the Lightning Network if you do want to see its development. And um, this is going to continue to grow at a crazy pace. So pause the video now if you do want to read that in more detail. Now, in terms of privacy, whether we're talking about Bitcoin or Ethereum, it is likely going to have to be hard forked into the network if we want it um, on layer one and for everyone. 
So one of the things the Ethereum core devs were talking about is whether or not we should have smaller, more frequent hard forks. So only implementing sort of one change at a time, we do them frequently, and that makes it less likely for saving up a lot of changes and causing controversy, exactly as we saw with Bitcoin Cash, for example, where there was a lot of changes that people didn't agree with, increases the chances that you're gonna split your community and make two new coins. So I think smaller, more frequent hard forks would be a good way to go, get all the exchanges to constantly be upgrading. Um, but let me know what you think in the comments below. Should privacy solutions be second layers um, that don't require hard forks? Uh, this is gonna be a very interesting uh, theme to watch unfold. Now, if you watch one video from the dozens of videos that I'm going to upload from EdCon, I did sort of three minute interviews to try and get as much information into the shortest period of time for you guys. But this was a 45 minute interview with the Ethereum Foundation. There was only a few of us in the press conference. So I got to fire about a dozen questions at Vitalik that have been eating away at me and he gave fantastic answers. This is all about the future of Ethereum and the new beacon chain. I've done a video on Ethereum 2.0. Please watch that if you haven't already, but there's a new chain coming to Ethereum. Now, let's get into the charts and talk about a trade idea that I shared with uh, my members a couple of weeks ago now. So it was around Wabi. I've got my Wabi hoodie on. They've rebranded as Teal. I let our uh, Facebook members know that this is going to be on Binance soon. That means they're going to be promoting the project. I'm not sure if this is a conflict of why they might have delisted modem as well, but uh, I will give you guys a bit of an insight if you want to pause now and read the sort of updates that we give our members where we have a look at fundamentals, technicals, and sentiment. And it was great to see Wabi um, explode high this week. And just today, I've given a second update for um, how to best get exposure to this and the way I see this playing out. Uh, going forward, we try to keep our Facebook members ahead of the market. And another video that they did receive this week was um, about margin longs and shorts. How you can look at these, whether they're extremes to, to get better feel of what's happening behind the scenes. What's everyone thinking? And this was a trade that I shared when Ripple was at 36 cents here saying, I think it's uh, heading lower. Um, and sure enough, that played out, which we'll check on the charts shortly. So in terms of Bitcoin, everyone is expecting Bitcoin to pull back. But if we step aside with an unbiased, we see that we've got time cycles pushing up, high volume on the breakout, low volume on the retrace. The RSI has had a bit of a chance to reset. We've touched the daily moving averages as support. We've hit some of our FIB levels that people like to watch. So I actually think that everything looks really healthy. And I'll talk about where Bitcoin's going just shortly. But bigger picture, this was the Adam and Eve double bottom that we did uh, for our members back in January when Bitcoin was trading at around 3,400. And not many people were thinking that that was going to be the bottom. A lot of people talking about Bitcoin going to $1,000. And one of the things that I really emphasized in this video for our members was the psychology behind this pattern, what you need to know, how this can form the, the not only this pattern, but the breakout and the target. And if we look at that Bitcoin daily chart now, we have achieved this perfectly. So I'm really starting to lean towards um, at least for um, Ethereum and altcoins. They've made so much ground that the bottom maybe in, but this can still be a long process. Here's that Wabi trade, guys. Um, let's head over to Bitcoin though. Let's bring up that weekly chart to show you guys what I'm talking about with that Adam and Eve, that double bottom, and then we get that target being reached perfectly um, from the, that pattern that builds. So on the weekly time frame, we're not seeing a lot as much volume coming in on the sell side. If we zoom into the daily, we can get a bit of a better picture. But what I see happening now, let's just take this off auto and show you the cycle brackets. Now, if we lose this level where the cycle has started here, and this is where um, the consolidation has started, around 4,900. If we lose that level and these daily supports, uh, the moving averages stop acting as a buy zone for traders, I think we move down here towards this 4,500. And this is where the 200 day moving average would come in. The date there is around the 26th if we have a slow grind lower. Now, whether you measure the fib retracement from this current move or you want to go back all the way to the bottom, as a few people have pointed out, we, we get a lot of um, confluence here. So look, that's that level that I'm looking at if we lose these levels. But at the moment, 
a lot of it looks really healthy. Now for Ethereum, we've pulled back a little bit more than I would have liked. Um, we've lost this sort of $170 level that was acting as resistance. We burst through it. I would have liked it to see it come back and test it as support, but we've broken through it, come back up and touched it. So this could be pushing down a little bit. Again, let's see if these daily moving averages, these EMAs can act as support. Uh, if not, that 200 day moving average is a long way down back at $150. But I don't see us getting all the way back down to 120 where this move sort of start. We see so many um, people with that feeling, I believe, that they've missed out, that they'd love to buy if Litecoin was to go back to $60, for example, after it's had such a huge run. You know, that video of the Litecoin halving we did when it was $30, I think so many people have that that feeling that, geez, I didn't buy enough alts at the lows now. So look, that's my thoughts on how the charts are playing out now. It can still be a very uh, long process where we grind uh, sideways for, for weeks or months at a time. But if you look at the altcoins and you look at the news, there is so many opportunities as we've had lately to have fantastic trades guys so if you do want to head over and start doing our investing trading and fundamentals education guys head to nuggetsnews.com.au we try to keep our facebook members one step ahead of everything that's happening as well as share plenty of ideas and build that sense of community to help each other stay one step ahead of the market otherwise hit that like button subscribe if you haven't already share these videos around and thanks for tuning in guys cheers